أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين uh, إن شاء الله before we begin we'll do what we normally do which is which is what review from last week so who can tell us last week we discussed uh, 21 signs which are good signs so who can tell us some of these signs yes let's go one by one yes good signs we only discuss good signs <laughs> we're gonna talk about that today dying on a Friday okay Die sweaty. So your whole body is profusely <laughs> sweaty. No, your forehead. Huh? Your forehead is sweaty. Okay, so dying with the sweat on forehead, right? So the Prophet Salaam Alaihi Wasallam said, a mu'min dies with a sweating forehead. Okay, yeah. Saying the shahada at the time of death. Saying the shahada at the time of death, yes. Yes. Okay. You only had one out of 21? And he took yours. You don't have any other. <laughs> All right. Yes, Karim. Dying in battle. Dying in battle for the sake of Allah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Dying in earthquake. Dying in an earthquake. Okay. Like what tragedy? Accident. Dying in a disease. Like a speeding car accident. Did we mention tsunami last week? Actually, actually, yes, because tsunami is a flood. Flood. Okay, and the flood is a good sign. Dying in a flood is a good sign. And also, what is a tsunami caused by? An earthquake. Okay. So a Muslim who dies in that. Also, there was another one which was a building collapsing. Yeah. Right, building collapsing also as a result of tsunami and as a result of flooding. Yes. Anyone else other than these guys? Yeah. Yes. Dying in a fire. Dying in a fire. Okay, what else? In a Dying in a plague. Yes. Uh, a woman dying during childbirth or any problems resulting from childbirth. Okay, yes. Uh, execution by an oppressive ruler. Right? We know that someone just got the death sentence. Right? Muhammad Mursi of Egypt just got given a death sentence for, I mean, unbelievable charges. Yes. Hmm? Dying of an abdominal illness. Dying of an, dying of an abdominal illness. Can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Now you can hear me. You can't hear me like before, but you can still hear me, right? This is much easier. Let me just get rid of this. So, uh, dying of an abdominal illness. What else? Yes. <coughs> Death from pleurisy, which is a disease, which is disease of the lungs. Okay. What else? Huh? Drowning. Okay. The, uh, death by drowning. Also, what else? Help somebody with good stuff. Helping somebody with good stuff. I mean, helping somebody and uh, you get die. Helping somebody, so you're fixing somebody's car and you die. No, no, no. you help somebody <laughs> and there's something wrong. Right. Something bad, I help for. Okay, actually, this is covered under the general heading of doing a good deed. Dying while doing a good deed is a great way to die, right? Everyone's gotta die, so you might as well die while doing something good, right? Dying yes. while reading Quran. That is another example of doing a good deed while dying. Yes. <laughs> Didn't we just cover that example? Okay. Dying while doing a good deed. Dying to save lives. Dying to save lives. That's again covered in good deeds. Travel in the plane. Did we mention that? Yes. Yes. That if you die while you're in a plane. No. In a good interview. Like you're going to Hajj and Umrah. Yes. Yeah, of course. But other than that, no. <laughs> yes. Tuberculosis. Dying from tuberculosis. Okay. Yes. 
Okay, that's a good one. That someone who dies and people have good things to say about them. Okay, generally good things to say about them. Remember that not to just make up stuff. Like some people, this is a bit odd that people do. Brothers on this side, would you like to come closer? Uh, uh, dying, um, if people say good things about you, then that is, then the Prophet said, Wajabat, that this has become, Jannah has become obligatory upon this person because the people who knew him, who lived with him, said good things about him. Right? Yes. Smiling at the time of death, we said, that's not necessarily itself a good sign, but this is, we said that this is normally associated with someone who dies as a shaheed. Normally. Okay, yes. A large group of people praying uh, pray upon a person. A large group of people praying upon him. This is this was not one of the signs but a, a side note that we mentioned. Right? And by the way, remind me before when we begin to mention something about dying while smiling. Okay, anybody else? We are missing a big section of them. Okay, let me cover them quickly so that we can remember. Um, let me just say all of them. Declaring the Shahada at the time of death. Dying with a perspiring forehead, meaning there is sweat on the forehead. Dying on the night or day of Jumu'ah. Martyrdom on the battlefield. Dying while away from home for fighting, in, for fighting in Allah's sake. Dying from a plague, from an abdominal illness, by drowning, from a building collapse. A woman's death during pregnancy or because of pregnancy. Uh, during pregnancy or during delivery. Uh, dying from burning, dying from pleurisy, dying from tuberculosis, dying while defending one's property. No one mentioned that. Do I hear an ice cream truck? No. When I hear that, I want an ice cream. <laughs> defending, dying while defending one's family. Okay, so if someone's family is being attacked and they fight and they die, they will die as a shaheed, as the Prophet ﷺ said. Uh, this is a good end. Dying while defending one's deen. Okay, defending one's deen. If someone, for example, puts a gun to our head and says, say that you're not a Muslim. Say, you know, say, curse the Prophet ﷺ. Curse Allah, na'udhu billah. Although you're allowed to say that, you are allowed to say that in order to save your life, but if a person didn't say that, then this would be this would not be a bad choice for him, you know. But if a person is forced, he's allowed to say and save that save his life. Although uh, at the same time, he must hate it in his heart. Okay, he must hate it in his heart. Um, and just as uh, let me mention that later, dying while standing as a guard in the way of Allah, dying while doing a good righteous deed, being killed by an oppressive ruler, being killed, being praised after death by righteous Muslims, okay? So, uh, just a side point, is that when it comes to a person being forced to do something, or at the threat of death, what is he allowed to do and what is he not allowed to do? Who can tell us? A person who is being forced at a, a like, for example, gunpoint, um, they are allowed to do anything. If someone says drink alcohol, they are allowed to drink alcohol. If they are, if they are told commit zina, they are allowed to commit zina. If, if it's a real threat, okay? Uh, they are allowed to um, say something bad about Islam. They are, about to, they are allowed to say, I'm not a Muslim, as long as they hate it in the heart. But the one thing which is not allowed, the one thing which is not allowed, is to take someone else's life, okay? Someone cannot, if someone puts a gun to your head and it says, look, you kill that person or we're going to kill you, okay? In that case, you're not allowed to obey them. Why? Because all human life is equal. And you, your life is not worth more than that person, okay? So in this case, you tell them, well, I'm not going to kill that person. You can go ahead and kill me. I will be shaheed, inshallah. Go ahead, hurry up. Don't waste time, right? <laughs> I want my lives in Jannah, <laughs> right? Don't waste time. So, but tell him I'm not going to do this because that person's life, whether he's a Muslim or a non-Muslim, okay, 
whether he's a sinner or a righteous person, whoever it is, you are not allowed to kill someone to save your own life. Okay? The only time where this would, well, not to save your own life, the only time, like for example, the example that let's say you are speeding down the road and you have only two ways to go and your car is, you know, your car has lost brakes and you know that you're going to kill someone because your car is not going to stop. So on one side you have more people and on one side you have less people. So in this case, obviously, you know, you make the best decision that, you know what, since I can't stop it, let me do what's the best that could be done, which is to save more people and kill lesser people. And, you know, it's in the hand of Allah. May Allah never put us in a situation like that, right? But uh, that's important to understand. Now, just one point about signs which are believed by people, but they're not true. So, some people consider the occurrence of certain natural phenomena, such as eclipses or earthquakes, when someone dies, an indication of the greatness and the worth of that person before Allah. This is a superstition belief, superstitious belief that Allah's Messenger وسلم, rejected because when the son of the Prophet وسلم, Ibrahim died, what happened? Uh, the sun was eclipsed on the same day. The sun was eclipsed on the same day, on the day that Ibrahim, the son of the Prophet وسلم, died. So the Prophet وسلم, he hastened to give a speech to the people in which he said, "Amma ba'du nas." Indeed, the people of Jahiliya used to think that the sun and the moon would not eclipse except when a great person dies. Indeed, the sun and the moon are amongst Allah's signs. They do not eclipse for any person's death or life. Allah only frightens His servants with that. So when you observe it, hasten to remembering Him, supplicating to Him, seeking His forgiveness, giving charity, freeing slaves, and praying in the masjids until it ends. Okay? So the people of Jahiliya, they used to believe that if some great person dies, then the sun or the moon might be eclipsed. Okay? But the Prophet said, no, this is not true. These are the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they have no attachment to anyone dying or being born. Now today we talk about those signs which are signs of an evil end, signs of a bad end. So number one obviously is a person dying while in disbelief. Okay, someone who dies without becoming Muslim, this is a very serious bad end and uh, we are not allowed to make dua for someone whose apparent religion was other than Islam. Okay? Now, someone says, well, how can you say that this person is in the hellfire when you don't know? We say, well, we don't say that this person is in the hellfire, but we say that anyone who dies without becoming Muslim is in the fire. We're not saying about this person. Allah knows, because maybe, for example, maybe one of the popes, for example, right? You know, popes, they have a lot of knowledge of their literature, and they have read stuff that most people will not see because, you know, there's something called the Catholic Archives, which they have some of the oldest stuff stored there, right? And they have access to that. Who knows that this Pope knew about Islam when he became Muslim secretly, right? This is in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So generally we say that, such as, that people who die without Islam is in the fire, but we should generally avoid saying such and such person is in the fire, okay? But... We do believe that anyone who dies without Islam is in the fire and this is a state of disbelief and we are not, once they die, we are not allowed to seek forgiveness for them. We are not allowed to ask Allah to forgive them. Um, the second act, the second sign is dying while performing an act of disobedience, okay? The same way, uh, with the same way when a person uh, says, uh, when he's doing something good and he dies and that this is a good thing same way if a person is doing something bad and he dies then this is a very bad thing right that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, combine his death with a, with a sin okay maybe someone is committing zina maybe someone was drunk uh, maybe someone was smoking right maybe somebody was watching porn and he died right so whatever it is, somebody was listening to music, right? And by the way, I don't know if anyone is here, listens to music in the car. But when a person is in the car, they have a much higher likelihood of, of dying. You know, someone, you might be driving safe, 
but someone else might be drunk and might come and ram you. A truck might lose control. This happens all the time, right? And someone who did not expect to die today dies. So when you're in the car, definitely, you shouldn't be listening to music anytime, but especially in places where the likelihood of death is higher, right? But we should make tawbah from listening to music to begin with and stay away from it. Uh, there are many cases like this. There are many cases like this, and a person who dies while listening to music, he will be raised while listening to music. Okay? And can you imagine that on the Day of Judgment, a person who everyone is scared for every little thing that they did that we think is little, right? Maybe he did not say Astaghfirullah enough times and he's worried about that, but then this guy, he's there listening to music on the Day of Judgment. And he will be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while listening to that music. Okay? So, that is a very serious thing. Number three is committing suicide. Okay, committing suicide. That is a very serious sin. It's a major sin in Islam. Uh, it does not take a per person out of the fold of Islam. It does not take a person out of the fold of Islam. However, it is a very serious sin, and there are multiple reports, for example, that the Sahaba, they saw a man who was fighting very bravely. And they mentioned this man in front of the Prophet So the Prophet said, Verily, he is one of the people of the fire. He is one of the people of the fire. And the Sahaba, they were, they were astonished to hear that. They said, how could this be that this guy is fighting so bravely in, a, in jihad fi sabirillah? How can be? How can he be in the fire? So they followed him. They followed him, and sometime later, indeed, what happened is that they, he was injured seriously in battle, and he couldn't take the pain. He could not take the pain, so he went to um, he went uh, in the field, and he put his sword down, like he kind of held something. Uh, against the sword so that it would stay up and then he jumped on it and he jumped on it that it came out from his back okay and he basically he killed himself because he couldn't take the pain and that's what the Prophet Sallallahu has foretold that this is a man of the fire okay now sometimes the pain might be physical sometimes the pain might be psychological okay in our time in our time most people that commit suicide they commit suicide out of psychological pain Okay, something that's bothering them to the point that they can't handle it and they take their own life. So you have people like, for example, Robin Williams and, you know, others like that, you know, well-known people, sometimes not so well-known, sometimes even in our community, right, someone hanged herself. So anyone who is having thoughts like this, there is help available, okay? There is a way to challenge and to cure and to um, reduce your psychological pain, okay? Uh, there, there are ways to get help. Uh, if anyone is feeling like that, or if you know anyone that is feeling like that, tell them to come and see me, and inshallah, I will try to help them as much as we can. And if you know someone who is down, who's feeling down and depressed, right? You know about them, you should help them, you should talk to them, you should give them company, try to find out what's going on, because if that person whom you know and you saw the signs of him being down, uh, they end up killing themselves, how will you feel about that? Right? And some people, they ignore signs like this and then they end up killing themselves because they could not forgive themselves for what happened. Okay? So I actually just wrote a paper on depression for one of my classes in psychology. And, uh, you know, we discussed in this paper what are the signs of a person being deeply depressed. Right? So one of the signs is, for example, all of a sudden a person is sleeping too much. Or all of a sudden a person is not sleeping at all. Okay? Uh, all of a sudden a person is, um, you know, he's just down. Or he's very irritable. All of a, he gets angry, you know, very quickly. You can light him up easy. You just say something, you, s you look at him the wrong way, he gets upset. It could be a sign of serious depression. Um, it could be a sign of serious depression. Okay, so uh, if you can help, try to help. If you know someone that is feeling like that, 
tell someone else about it. Tell someone else about it who may be able to help them before it is too late. This is a very common thing. It's happening uh, in, you know, in the society that we live in. Um, and, and it's not true, it's not true that by simply <coughs> praying more and making more dhikr, he will be fine. Okay? Although it is, it is true in, in reality, but practically, that person who is praying, he may not understand what he's saying in his prayer. Okay? He may not understand what he's reciting from the Quran. And that type of recitation and that type of salah will not have the same impact as the type of salah in which he's understanding what he's saying. Okay? Salah is a type of therapy. Okay? When someone is depressed, they go to a therapist, right? But salah itself is a type of therapy. The recitation of the Quran is a type of therapy. Okay? Listening to the Quran, especially if you understand the Quran, is a type of therapy. Okay? But for someone to say, oh, just, just be more religious and you will be fine, you can't say that to everyone. Okay? You can't say that to everyone because not everyone understands what it really means to be truly religious. To be truly religious. And also sometimes there is something called clinical depression. Okay? Clinical depression is where someone's brain is shooting a certain chemical which makes him depressed more than balancing it. Okay, the, there, there are two chemicals, there are multiple chemicals that are basically the balance between them is natural normal life. So when we get happy, our brain basically shoots dopamine, right? That makes us feel good. And when we get upset, what's the, what's the sad chemical? Who knows? Serotonin, right? So it makes you feel sad. So sometimes it is possible that a person, uh, clinically they're having this problem, so they have to go to actually a psychiatrist who will give them medication to balance these chemicals. To balance these chemicals, right? So this is also not true that if you are taking a, a, a type of medication to make you feel better, then this means that you are uh, being numbed down. Okay, I used to think that for a long time that the, the, the medicine that the mental doctors give you is just to numb your brain. Actually, this is not true. When I did my research for this paper, I found out that actually no. Sometimes the medication is to balance the chemicals. It's to balance the chemicals, right? And also, an important thing to understand is that don't, there is a stigma attached to getting help. There's a stigma attached to getting help, and by the way, in our communities, like Pakistani, India, Bangladesh, right? In our communities, this is like unbelievable, like, what do you mean? You think I'm crazy that I have to go to a uh, psychologist? Do you think I'm mental, right, as they say back home, right? Do you think I'm mental? But actually, this is a serious problem, and it can happen, and it does happen back home too. It does happen back home, but we don't call it what we call it here. We don't call it the same thing. And there are different ways that people show up their depression. Sometimes they close the doors on everybody. And sometimes they go do stupid things outside, right? So sometimes they may go kill themselves. Sometimes they may join a gang where they kill other people, okay? They might start becoming violent, right? They, they might become rapist, right? You know, many of the rapists, they have a problem of a family problem in their own families. And this deep hole that's in them, they kind of try to fill that hole by acting in this way where they rape other people and it kind of, the, 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 the screams and stuff makes them forget that pain. Also another type, uh, another way a person shows their depression is by cutting themselves. Have you ever heard of people cutting themselves? Yes. Right? You know why they cut themselves? Because the pain in their mind is so bad that they cut themselves and that physical pain makes them forget the pain of the mind. Okay? So these are serious problems. These are serious problems and as you know that we had a person in our community, right? And not, not necessarily in our community but someone related to our community who uh, killed herself by hanging. Okay? And we even had her janazah 
in the madrasa. Actually, we're going to talk about the issue of the janazah for someone like that, inshallah. Yes, do you have a question? Okay. Yes. Back home, they used to say that, like, for a Muslim who committed suicide, you're not allowed to pray their janazah. Okay, for a Muslim who committed suicide, you're not allowed to pray their janazah. This is not correct. This is not correct. The reason why this is, is because um, the Prophet wasallam. it's true that he did not pray the janazah of a person who had committed suicide. Okay? But he did not say that you don't pray the janazah too. He said, I will not pray, you go ahead and pray. Okay? So the scholars, they said, that a person who commits a serious sin, a person who commits a very severe sin, for example, suicide, then in order to teach the people a lesson, the leader of the community should not pray the janazah in order to teach others a lesson that if I do the same thing, I will have the same thing. Meaning that the Imam or in this case, the Prophet may not lead my, my Salatul Janazah. Okay, one of my teachers, Sheikh Walid Basuni, he, uh, he actually had a Janazah, and uh, he asked the people that, uh, does this person pray? Did this person pray? And they said, no, he never prayed. He said, did you ever see him pray? They said, we never saw him pray. He said, well, in that case, you go ahead and pray the Janazah. I'm not going to pray the Janazah over him. Okay, and by the way, some of the scholars they consider a Muslim, uh, someone who was born in a Muslim family but who never prays. Some of the scholars they say that his food is not halal, even if he's buying halal meat. Even if he's buying halal meat, you should not go and eat in his house. You should, because you know, uh, for you to have normal relations with this person is kind of saying, hey. You can be whatever you want, we accept you as you are. At the same time, at the same time, there's another side to it, which is that the Prophet ﷺ lived in Medina, and where the society was Muslim at large. Okay? Living in America, if we abandon someone, there are other people who are willing to take them. So, by you not, to, you know, like for example, when a kid does something bad, so the parents say, we will not talk to you. Right? So the kid really feels the pain that my parents are not talking to me. Because he only has two parents and both of them are not talking to him. He doesn't have 15 parents. But if he had 15 parents, for example, and two were not talking, he'll say, okay, I'll just go talk to them. Okay? So living in a non-Muslim society, living in a non-Muslim society, sometimes not praying the janazah for someone could have a negative impact. Where the person will say, well, you know what, if the Muslims will not accept me, the non-Muslims will. Okay, and that's exactly what happened actually, that when this girl died, when this girl died, when she killed herself, the, the local church, they said, look, we will pay for the entire funeral, and we will have the viewing in our, in our church. You can invite everyone. Okay, so they are ready to jump in. They are ready to jump in living in America. So we have to be very careful when we apply, when we apply this ruling that we are not going to pray this person's janazah. We have to make sure that the impact will be the right impact and there will be no bigger negative impact of it. Okay? So this is a, so actually it was a, when the, that case happened, it was a debate that we had amongst ourselves in the management. And I consulted many scholars uh, that are my friends about it that should we pray the janazah or not. And all of them, they advise that you should pray the janazah because this is not the same uh, society as the society at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And you could have a negative impact as a result of this. And by the way, there were other cases, other issues in this in there as well. And sometimes you might think that a person killed themselves, but sometimes they actually, uh, sometimes their mental illness is so severe right, that they are having a hallucinations, where they're doing something, but what they're seeing is that somebody else is doing to them, okay, you know, you know about that, when some people have schizophrenia, they hear voices, they hear voices in their head, saying you're no good, you're ugly, 
your desk all the time, all the time, right? And that's what makes them the way they are. And they, and you know, if one of those people, if they end up killing themselves, uh, it's very possible that, you know, whoever the voices that they were hearing in their head were maybe driving him to do something, pushing him to do something, that he couldn't control himself, right? And sometimes you can be overwhelmed, overwhelmed by this type of thing where it's kind of like someone is telling you to do something, right? Someone is telling you to do something. So this is not, this is a very serious case. At the same time, this idea also might be something that people might have taken from the Christians because the Christians, they do not give any rights to a person who committed suicide. Okay, and historically, what they used to do is that someone who committed suicide, they used to actually behead them. They used to behead them. How's that? Okay, um, the next sign, the next negative sign is refusing to say the Shahada at the time of death. Okay, so the, we talked about it that when a person is on his deathbed, what are we supposed to say to them? We're supposed to say, say la ilaha illallah, say la ilaha illallah. And we're not supposed to be, be very nice, but actually we're supposed to kind of pressure them a little bit, right? Gentle pressure, right? Give them some pressure that say la ilaha, command them. The Prophet said, command them to pray, say the shahada, right? And sometimes they may say, sometimes they may not say it because they're not in their right state of mind all the time, right? And we mentioned the example of the person who the Prophet went and he said, uh, oh my uncle, say the shahada. So what did the uncle say? What did the man say? This was not Abu Talib, this was an Ansari man. So the Prophet went to him, he was about to die. So the Prophet said to him, Oh my uncle, say the shahada. Say la ilaha illallah. So what did he say? He said, am I your maternal uncle or your maternal <laughs> uncle? <laughs> so he was, you know, he was more concerned at the time of death is that am I your paternal uncle or maternal uncle? So the Prophet said, you are my maternal uncle. Okay. He said, what you are saying to me, is it good for me? He said, yes, it's good for me. It's good for you. So then he said it and then he died. Okay. But also, uh, Sa'id ibn Musayyib reported from his father, uh, عنه, that when the Prophet Sallallahu uncle Abu Talib approached death, the Prophet went to him and he said, Ya Ammi, Qul la ilaha illallah. Oh my uncle, say la ilaha illallah, a statement, kalimatan, uh, a statement with which I will testify for you before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just say la ilaha illallah once, so that I will say to Allah that Ya Allah, my uncle said la ilaha illallah, forgive him. But he, ref he would not say it, he would not say it, and whenever actually there are some reports that say that he was about to say it. He was about to say it. But Abu Jahl was sitting there as well. And Abu Jahl, when he was about to say it, when he saw that he's about to say it, Abu Jahl said, Abu Talib, are you going to leave the religion of your father? Right there reminding him, right? Shaitan. Are you going to leave the religion of your father at the, at the moment of death? That's your coward? That's what he's saying, right? That you lived your life a certain way, but at the end of the, at the end, you're gonna change it another way. So Abu Talib would not say it, fearing to displease the disbelievers who were present. Thus, the last thing he said before death was, "I am upon the faith of my, of Abdul Muttalib, my father. I am upon the deen of Abdul Muttalib." Thus, his benevolence and help to the Muslims did not avail him. Okay, Abu Talib helped Islam a lot. And he helped the Prophet وسلم, a lot. And he protected the Prophet وسلم, a lot. The only thing that, 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 helped, that the, this help helped him is that his punishment in the hellfire was reduced. Was reduced. The Prophet وسلم, said, Ahwanu ahlan nari adaban Abu Talib. Okay? The least, the, uh, the, the lightest in punishment among the people in is Abu Talib, he wears two shoes from fire which causes his brain to boil. Okay, this is the lightest punishment, right? And in other words, in other hadith, that the fire only reaches up to his ankles. 
Okay, and in this hadith, that his shoes are made of fire. They both mean the same thing, basically. Right? So, but even though this is the lightest punishment, but this punishment is so severe that the shoes of fire will make his brain boil. Okay? Why? Because he did not say, La ilaha illallah. Although he protected the Prophet ﷺ for how many years? For 11 years. Okay? For 11 or 10 years in Mecca, he protected the Prophet ﷺ. How did he protect the Prophet? Abu Talib was the head, was the head, the leader of Banu Hashim. Okay? And basically by him saying that, look, I give you protection, what it means is that if anyone harms the Prophet ﷺ, the entire clan of Banu Hashim will be at their throats. Okay? So no one until Abu Talib was alive, no one was able to physically harm the Prophet ﷺ. Okay? But after Abu Talib died, who became the head of Banu Hashim? Who became the head of Banu Hashim? Abu Jahal, no, Abu Jahal, Jahal was not from Banu Hashim. Abu Jahal was the leader of Quraysh. But he was not the leader of the tribe of the Prophet Sallallahu What tribe was Abu, Abu Jahal from, who knows? Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan was from Banu Umayyah. Which tribe was uh, Abu Jahal from? Abu Jahal? Yes. <coughs> Actually, the one who led uh, Bani Hashim is uh, Abu Lahab. Yes, after Abu Talib, yeah. Abu Lahab became the leader. After Abu Talib, Abu Lahab became the leader. Now, Abu Talib was the one who was protecting. What was Abu Lahab doing all this time? Abu Lahab was there creating problems for the Prophet Wasallam. Right? When the Prophet would go and speak to someone and tell them about Islam, Abu Lahab used to follow the Prophet. And after the Prophet leaves, Abu Lahab would go up to him and he would tell him, Look, this is my nephew. Don't listen to him. He's crazy. Okay? And his wife, she used to put garbage in the way of the Prophet She used to put thorns in the way of the Prophet So what did Allah say about Abu Lahab in the Quran? Who knows? Yeah. Okay. Right? That uh, Abu Lahab, he said, uh, he said, may tabbat yada. How do you translate tabbat yada? Uh, it was a, it was a, it was a um, kind of like, uh, it was a curse. Um, it was a manner of speaking. It was a manner of speaking. Like for example, you know, we say what's up. What's up doesn't really mean what's on the roof, right? What's up means what's going on, how's everything, right? So tabbat yada was a way of saying, although it means that may his hands be uh, destroyed or something like that. Huh? What's the translation? Yeah, give me the translation. That's a good thinking man right here. So, wow. Perdition overtake. <laughs> Perdition overtake both hands of Abu Lahab and he will perish. <laughs> that his wealth will not help him, nor what he earned. Sayyasla uh, Dawa, he shall scorn. He shall soon burn in fire that flames that Lahab. Now, Wamra'atuhu and his wife, the bearer of fuel, fuel Hammalat al Hatab, Fiji diha, upon her neck, a halter of strongly twisted rope. Okay? So, basically, um, Abu Lahab was called the father of Lahab, Abu Lahab, because Lahab means flame. And the reason why he's, he was called Abu Lahab was what? Who knows? He, he had red skin. He, he did not have red skin, but he was light in color and he had reddish cheeks that looked like flames. I mean, he was a handsome man. He was a very handsome man, right? So they called him the one of the flame, like he has flames in his face. 
out of beauty, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the, the real flames of Abu Lahab are the ones that are going to burn him, okay? And his wife as well. So actually this ayah, this surah, is actually one of the proofs of the Quran, by the way. If anyone wants to deg debate with you that is Quran really the word of Allah, then Surah Al-Lahab is actually one of the proofs that the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who can tell us how? How well? How Surah Al-Lahab is a proof for the truth of the Quran, that this is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes? Okay, so this Surah was revealed saying that Abu Lahab is in the fire while Abu Lahab was still alive. And he heard about this as well. Okay? Now, all Abu Lahab had to do to disprove the Qur'an is to say, Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah. Right? Yeah. Saying, look, you're saying I'm in the fire, but hey, I'm becoming Muslim. He could disprove the Qur'an. But it never occurred to him. It never occurred to him to become Muslim and say, look, I'm a Muslim, but you see, this thing says I'm in the fire. Okay? So this is a proof that although he had a chance, he still did not become Muslim. Although he wanted to disprove Islam, he could not do it this way. He did not come out and say that I am a Muslim. In Allah, la yahdil indeed. Number, whatever number we are on, is accusation from righteous Muslims. Okay, remember the same way that if someone dies and righteous Muslims have good things to say about them? The same way if someone dies and righteous Muslims who knew this person have bad things to say about him. Okay, so this is also a very serious uh, bad end that people think bad about him. People think bad about him at the time of his death, after his death. So what is the lesson that we learn from this? The lesson that we learn from this is that Number one, we should be good to all people. Number one, we should be good to all people. Number two, is that those people who are righteous, those people who are righteous, they have more of a right for us to be nice and kind to them. Okay, because remember the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that man adali waliyan, right? Whoever uh, whoever declares war against my wali, my friend, meaning a righteous person, then I will declare war on him. That's Hadith Qudsi. That's Hadith Qudsi, right? The Prophet said that Allah said, right? That whoever, basically, if you know someone is righteous, someone who is, recites the Quran, you know, you know, kids who are kuffas and stuff like that, you should, even if they do something bad to you, then stay away, let it go. Because... Maybe they did something, everyone is a sinner. Even the most righteous people are sinners. But these people's goodness may be a lot more than their sin. Okay? And you don't want to get on their bad side. You don't want to get on their bad side. At the same time, if so-called righteous Muslim wants to hurt someone by saying something bad at the time of their death while this person didn't deserve it, then this will not make any difference. Okay? Because you cannot, because Allah knows what's in the heart. Okay, like for example, let's say I had a problem, one person had a problem with someone and uh, he was considered a righteous Muslim. Uh, and at the time of his death, he said, you know, this person was a very evil person. If that person was evil, then yes, it will matter. But if that person was not evil, then it will not matter. It will not matter. Okay. The next sign of an evil end is addiction to alcohol is addiction to alcohol and in our time we could extend this to drugs as well okay basically what alcohol really is is khamr intoxication okay so any type of intoxication any type of intoxication whether it's in a liquid form it's in a gas form or it's in a powder form um, nowadays they actually have these stores where they have candies <laughs> chocolate candies and this candy and that candy but in it they are laced with some type of intoxication so you know uh, people make brownies and they put that stuff in there and then they're like hey we're not selling drugs we're selling brownies right huh How do you pronounce, it again? pronounce what the name of the store okay <laughs> intoxication <laughs> 
Khamr. Khamr? Yes, Khamr. Any, yeah, basically anything that impairs your mind, your judgment, you know, basically the, in, the effect of intoxication, being high or being drunk, okay? So, um, <laughs> there's, there's this guy, he, uh, he, he had this interview with an FBI agent who was a specialist in drug enforcement. And he said, well, I want to know what the names of drugs are. <laughs> what, what are the names of the drugs, right? And he said, do you have any other names other than weed and this? And he had a list of like 30 names <laughs> already. And the guy was looking at him and he's like, you have all these names and you want to know more? <laughs> and then he said to him, he said, well, if, I, if someone ever gets caught by you for having drugs, what should they say so that you will let them go? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what to say. <laughs> so, you just, you know, having fun with it. So, um, addiction to alcohol. The Prophet ﷺ said, Mudminul khamri immata lati Allahu ka'abidi wathanin. He who is addicted, he who dies addicted to khamr, will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as an idol worshipper. As an idol worshipper. Also, another sign is ill treatment towards the parents. Ill treatment towards the parents, uh, and uh, also lacking ghira or ghira. Okay, let's talk about what that means. Number one, uh, what's the evidence? Ibn Umar radiAllahu anhu he reported that the Prophet sallallahu said, "Thalathatun qad haram Allahu alayhim al jannah mudmin al khamr wal aqu wal aq." Three persons are prohibited from entering Jannah. Mudmin al Khamr, one who is addicted to Khamr. Wal Aq, the one who is disobedient to his parents or her parents. What do youth? And the do youth. What does do youth mean? Do youth means a person whose family. Uh, especially the women of his family are doing inappropriate things okay for example they're talking to men which are not their relatives they are flirting around they are dressing inappropriately right so they're doing this kind of stuff if not worse okay they're committing zina that's obviously much worse but even the initial stages of, of zina which is flirting or being free with men uh, who are not relatives. So if there's a man whose family, who's the woman of his family are doing this and he doesn't care about that, this is the youth, the youth, okay? And he is cursed. He is cursed. Then how come the women of your family are behaving like this and you care, you don't care about that? It doesn't bother you, right? It should bother any good Muslim man and the Prophet said that whoever is like that, then he is prohibited from entering Jannah. He is prohibited from entering Jannah. So this is the sign of an evil end. Yes. Who was the first part? The first was al uh, Khamr, the the one who is addicted to the to intoxication, the one who is uh, 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 disobedient to parents, and the youth, the the youth, the one who is who has no <laughs> sense of shame. Uh, and no sense of care with regards to his family being inappropriate with the opposite gender, okay? Do you think that it applies to our boys being inappropriate with girls? Yes. Yes, yes, right? So it applies both ways. Yes, yeah, anyone have any questions? I saw a raised hand. Is it like a person who's committing it in the family or is it just someone who's letting it happen? Or the person who's committing it, he's in worst himself, right? But the man, the, the one who's in charge of the household, he knows that this is happening, but he doesn't care about it. It doesn't bother him, right? Also, it would apply, like, for example, if kids are watching porn, and the father knows about it, and he doesn't, it doesn't bother him, right? You know, subhanAllah, I have met parents. I have met parents, Muslim parents, right? Pakistani, Bangladeshi parents, who say, well, you know, this is part of life in America. My, my girl, you know, they have sometimes I've, I know a family that 
their son brings his girlfriend home and stays in their bedroom. Okay? And the parents know about it, and the mother is upset about it, but the father says, well, he's a young man. What can we do? Okay? So this is uh, the youth. This is someone who doesn't uh, care, who, who is a very serious sin. Also, another sign of uh, an evil end is actually a sudden death. A sudden death. Someone who dies in a flash. Okay? Why is that a bad sign? What do you think? And by the way, someone who said a plane crash. A plane crash, in most cases, is a sudden death. Okay? Like the train The train crash. The plane crash. Right? Uh, this, this is a sudden death. And a sudden death is a negative sign. Who can tell us why? Because you didn't. No, no. Why is this a bad? Why is this considered a bad thing? Yes. Maybe because if you have a sudden death, you don't have time to uh, go back to it and think about it. Exactly. If you have a sudden death, you don't get a chance to make tawbah at the last minute. You don't get a chance to say the shahada at the last minute. Okay, and that's why. That's why you know. Uh, like for example, when I hear about people who have cancer, when I hear about people who have cancer or some type of terminal illness, and the doctor says, "Well, you have six months to live," you know, many times people feel down. But actually, that is a great nema of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, mm. right? A good Muslim would love to be warned that, "Hey, you have six months to fix up," <laughs> right? Even if you if you're told you have one hour, that's a great thing, <coughs> right? If you make tawbah, even if a person has committed shirk, if he makes sincerely, if he makes tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before the time of death arrives, when he starts to see the angels, right? Before that time, he will be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So actually, a warning about death is a positive thing. And no warning about death is a bad thing. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from this. That we wish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us time before we die to make tawbah, to uh, say the shahada as the last thing, to give advice to our family, right? Say good words to them and go in a good way, right? Because sudden death is a sudden death. Um, oh, by the way, it just reminds me that uh, one of the signs, one of the uh, danger signs is uh, of suicide, suicide is if someone is saying goodbye to his relatives without any reason for it, right? So one guy, he calls you, he says, hey, you know, I just want to say, forgive me for anything. Uh, I just want to say goodbye, farewell. Like, what do you mean? Why are you saying this, right? So that should be a, a cause for concern, right? Actually, a few days ago, what happened is that one brother that comes here, some, many of you know him, uh, brother Imtiaz, Imtiaz Lidu. Right, drive jitney. So he was sending a message to someone saying goodbye, we'll talk later. And somehow, mistakenly, that message came to me. And that message came to me at 4 20 a.m. I said, Oh my god! <laughs> so after Fajr, I took some brothers on his to his house and I knocked on his door. I said, is everything, he, he opened the door scared, like, you know, like, why am I knocking his door at this time when it's not normal? He said, is everything okay? I'm like, you tell me, is everything okay? <laughs> He's like, what, what are you talking about? I'm like, look, this is the message that I got from you. He said, oh my God, I don't know, this is a problem in my phone. I said, well, if it's a problem in your phone, that's good. <laughs> if it's a problem in you, that's bad. <laughs> huh? As long as he's not suicidal. As long as he's not suicidal, right? And that's one. Another sign of suicide, or another sign to watch for, is when someone gives away his prized possessions. Okay? Like, for example, someone says, uh, someone calls you and says, Hey, brother, these are the books. You know that he loved his books. He says, Brother, you can take my books. Right? He had a watch that he loved. He said, Another call, take my watch. Right, actually, I, I knew a case like that, someone in our neighborhood in Pakistan, that this person, one day he called his son, and this person he used to write, and he loved his pens. 
So he called his son and he gave him his pence. He gave him his pence, right? The next day he died in a car accident. Okay, so some could say that, well, maybe, you know, he just felt like it and it was a natural thing. And, but then when I was doing my research for the depression and the reasons, you know, signs of suicide, I thought about it that, well, you know what? What had actually happened is that all of a sudden he stepped in front of a moving car. So, Allahu Alam, what really happened, right? Allahu Alam, what really happened? So a sudden death, the Prophet Sallallahu said, a sudden death is a wrathful take. Mawthul fajati akhdatul ghadabi. Okay? That uh, a sudden death is a wrathful take. Wrathful meaning that this is a punishing way of taking the soul. A sudden death. Okay? So we want to have sign. Did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi have a sudden death? No. It's an action. He had a natural death and he, he knew that he was on his deathbed, right? Did Abu Bakr have a natural death, have a sudden death? No. No. Did Umar have a sudden death? Yes. 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 No. No. Who said that? Someone stabbed him one. Someone stabbed him, but he lived for three days. Oh. <laughs> he didn't die right away. He yeah. Died. He Not only he did not die, but he actually selected a council of people to select the next Khalifa amongst them, right? Uh, he asked Aisha radiallahu anha that if he could be buried in that room, right? Uh, so he did not die suddenly. Did Uthman radiallahu anha have a sudden death? No. He did not have a sudden death. They actually came in his room and they, ex they basically killed him, right? Uh, they were, this is the death by an oppressor, oppressor, okay? And this is Shahada, you know, the Prophet yes. says. Did Ali have a sudden death? No. No, he did not have a sudden death, right? Also, he was attacked at the morning time. Someone came out of the darkness and struck him and it cut from one side of the shoulder all the way down to the stomach. However, he also lived for some time. He also lived for some time and then died later on. Okay, so sudden death is generally a bad sign. How about if a person has sudden death in Hajj? Is that a bad sign? Good sign. That's a good sign, right? Because that Hajj overrides this, right? He died a sudden death doing a good deed. Okay, so the good deed overrides it. Dying, another bad sign, is dying before repenting from a major sin. Okay, dying before repenting from a major sin. Now sometimes we may know, sometimes we may not know if a person repented or not. Okay, so what are these? For example, one who commits a murder. One who commits a murder. Also, one who commits zina and he did not repent from it. Right? And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said that when a person commits a sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angels to withhold their pens for six. Okay? Withhold their pens for six. Now what is this six? They could be six seconds, they could be six hours, six minutes, six days. Okay? But they wait for these six and then they write it down. And if within those six, the person makes tawbah, he makes, a, um, who make, he makes a stifah, then that sin is not written for him. Okay? So, uh, this is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a lesson for us that if we ever do commit a sin, which, you know, we're all human beings, if we do commit a sin, then immediately make tawbah. Don't wait. Immediately make tawbah, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَكْفِرُ ذُنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَمْ يُسِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ That... He also said, وَمَنْ تَعْلُوا وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَإِنَّهُ يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَدَادًا Now, I'll return back. وَمَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا مَنْ تَابَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَإِنَّهُ يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَتَادًا That's in the Surah Al-Furqan And in the next ayah فَأُولَاكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ Yeah, but that's all the way after that It's right next to it It is? Yes It's in the end of the Surah They're both together Yeah The two ayah together 
So the, the person makes sincere tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a sin that they have done, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually turns that into a good deed for him. Okay, he turns that, he writes that as a good deed. And the ayah which I mentioned earlier, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describing the believers, he says, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً That if they commit an inappropriate, a lewd thing, right, in a fahisha, you know, in zina or lying, any type, any type of thing, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ Or they oppress themselves, ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ They remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do you remember Allah? By saying it's astaghfirullah at the time of, at the time that you have committed the sin. Saying astaghfirullah. Fastaghfaru li dhunubihim and they ask Allah for forgiveness for their sin. Walam yusirru ala ma fa'alu and they do not continue and they do not persist in that sin. They do not persist in that sin. Meaning that let's say a person is um, uh, let's say that a person is uh, stealing money. Okay. Let's say a person is saying robbing, right? So this person doesn't say, uh, you know, he goes and gets like five guys and he's like, puts out a gun and he's like, give me your money, right? Takes his money, astaghfirullah. Okay, now you give me your money, astaghfirullah. Now you give me your money, astaghfirullah. No. He stops his sin, right? He stops his sin, at least for that time. At least for that time, sincerely. <laughs> it seems like you guys have seen cases like this. <laughs> the funniest jokes are real jokes. <laughs> so, uh, stuff it a lot. <laughs> you know, some of the scholars, they used to, they used to make a stick fire before doing an action, and during an action, and after an action. So if someone is a really good guy, he'll say, Astaghfirullah, give me your money, Astaghfirullah. And he takes the money and says, Astaghfirullah. <laughs> but, you know, you can't fool Allah. You can't fool Allah. So, uh, so the, the condition of forgiveness is that a person, at least at that time, he sincerely repents and he says, I'm not going to do it again. Sincerely. If he does it again, after some time, he makes tawbah again. He's forgiven again. After some time, he makes tawbah, he does it again, he makes tawbah again sincerely. I will not do it again. He's forgiven again. As long as he's sincere, that I will not do it again. Right? But if he's planning, if he's planning, then you know what? I'm going to do it tomorrow again. Then this tawbah is not accepted. Then this tawbah is not accepted. So one who commits zina, and especially with one's neighbor, especially with one's neighbor, this is a very serious sin. One who deliberately lies against the Prophet ﷺ. An arrogant person, especially if he is poor. Right? These are all sins that if a person died before making uh, tawbah, then this is an evil sign. <coughs> an arrogant person, especially if he is poor. Why is it wrong? Why is it especially wrong to be arrogant when a person is poor? Yeah. You got nothing to be arrogant about and you're still arrogant, right? <laughs> also, uh, a woman who imitates men, a woman who imitates men is a very serious sin. And also, by the way, a man who imitates women is also a very serious sin, right? And this, by the way, is the evidence that jewelry for men is not allowed, except a ring, okay? Jewelry for men is not allowed because wearing jewelry, even in today's time, even in today's America, even in America, jewelry is still considered something that ladies wear. Okay? Can you imagine like the president coming out wearing a chain around his neck? It's not going to happen. Not anytime soon. Unless it's a lady. Right? The battery guy? Right? A governor. Right? You will never see them in, in stuff like that. There is a certain thing that is associated with that. Also one who backbites a Muslim, also one who lies sometimes with oaths to make his business prosper, right? So someone, he's selling a house, for example, someone who's selling a car, and he says, Wallahi, Wallahi, there's nothing wrong in this car. And he knows that there's something wrong with the car. <laughs> okay? This is a very serious thing. Yes. Uh, the one who backbites a Muslim, 
the one who imitates um, a woman who imitates men or a man who imitates women. Also, one who performs an act of worship for worldly benefit. <coughs> Can anyone give me an example of act uh, performing an act of worship for worldly benefit? Yeah. Praying like to show the people. Praying to show the people. Okay, what else? There's a common thing today, and I'm mentioning this to you, you guys who are memorizing Quran. There's a common thing in our time, which is that reciters of the Quran, they have a price on reciting the Quran. Okay? They will say, well, a litrawi in your masjid, if you pay me $12,000. If you pay me, there's a guy that I knew, he used to get uh, like $20,000, $30,000. He had a very good voice, right? But he had a price up front, right? There's nothing wrong with people giving you something for the travel that you did, right? For the inconvenience of being out of your hometown. That's all understandable, right? But for a person to be exorbitant in that and say that this is the only way I'm going to do it, I'm not going to do it, right? So in that case, like sometimes, for example, what some people do is to protect their brand to protect their brand, if they will not do it to buy and get paid for it, they won't do it at all. They won't even do it in their local masjid for free, right? So, you know, this is an example of doing an act of worship for a worldly benefit, okay? There should be no price put on it. If anyone gives anything, that's fine. Also, the, a price can be put, basically, they could say that, look, my expenses are this. Okay, and I work, for example, and I'm going to leave my job for a month and come to your masjid in your community and leave the Raweed. So it makes sense, you know, maybe it could be double what he earns, right? But to say something like 10, 15, 20 times of what he earns in that month, that's not really, it doesn't make sense. And especially to ask for it, especially to make it a condition. Also, a stingy person who announces anything he gives for Allah and expects to be paid back for it, right? So, um, you know, like for example, uh, one time, well, I don't want to mention any example because someone might know. Uh, for example, someone says, hey, I'm going to give you a table as a donation, okay? And um, he t every time, you know, that table, for example, let's say this happens to be this table, he says, well, you know, this is the table that I gave, but I don't like this speaker that's coming. So can you please not put my table over there and put someone else's table there? Right? He's kind of like saying a condition. Also, he also may, always makes it known that guess who gave this table? Guess who gave this table, right? <laughs> so uh, this, someone, this is a very serious sin. Also, uh, uh, yeah, when you give a donation, when you give a donation for the sake of Allah, that then whoever is the managing person, then they are in charge of that. Okay? If you bring a thog, for example, to hang over here for people to use, you can't, after you have given it as a donation, you can't say who can wear it and who cannot wear it. Okay? Someone who's wearing it, you can't go up to him and tell him, by the way, I donated that thing, can you please sit over there because that place is dirty and the thog might get dirty. You have no right to say that. Right? You give a chair, you give money, right? Unless you specify at the time of your donation that look, this money is to be used to paint the masjid. Okay? So in that case, if the masjid accepts that money on that condition, then they are bound by that condition. But if you say, no, this is just a general donation, then you can't say, hey, why did you buy bathroom supplies for the money that I gave you instead of putting a new car here? Well, you didn't say that up front, so you, you don't have a right to say it now. Also, a sinful old man, a sinful old man. So why is this a specially serious sin? Sinful old man? A sinful old man. Actually, in another hadith, the word that is mentioned is a, sh a shaykhun zani. Shaykhun zani. Okay? Shaykh is like an old man, uh, linguistically, and zani is someone who commits zina. Yeah. <laughs> Since they're all they're gonna die soon. <laughs> <laughs> because what? he spent his life uh, without anything to good. Uh, a combination of these things. Number one, that yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna say he knows he's about to die soon, but yeah, he's not. 
basically, an uh, old man knows that his death is near because we're not going to live past 100, right? So if you've already reached 70, uh, more than likely you're going to go soon, right? But still a person persists in doing bad deeds, persists in doing sins. Right now his energy is low and still he's doing sins. And also the Prophet said that there are three men that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not, three types of people that Allah will not look at them and Allah will not purify them. Okay, who are these people? These are people, a shaykh Zani, an old man who commits zina, a poor man who is arrogant, and who knows the third one? Not backbiters. Uh, a king who is a liar. A king who is a liar. Because all of these sins, they go against the nature of that person, right? The nature of that person's role. For example, a king, he is already the king. He is the most powerful person. Why is he still lying? He shouldn't lie. He's the powerful man, right? He's the king. Sheikh Hunzani, an old man, he's reached old age, but he's still committing zina. And a poor man who is arrogant, that he doesn't have anything to be arrogant about, he's still, he's still arrogant, right? So uh, that doesn't, by the way, mean that a rich man can be arrogant. But that's also a sin. And the Prophet said, whoever. Uh, has er whoever has an atom's weight of arrogance and pride in his heart, he will not smell the fragrance of Jannah. And according to some narrations, the Prophet ﷺ said that the fragrance of Jannah can be spent, can be can be smelled, 70 years away from Jannah. So the person who has an atom's weight of pride, he will not even get 70 years distance of Jannah. Okay. And uh, lastly, one who likes to perform and promote sins amongst the Muslims. One who likes to promote sins amongst the Muslims. This is a very serious sin. So someone who used to do that, for him to die without making tawbah from that is a very serious sin. What is an example of promoting sins amongst Muslims? Can anyone tell me? What is an example of promoting sins? Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُحِبُّونَ أَن تَشِيعَ الْفَاحِشَةُ فِي الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Yes. A Muslim selling haram products at the masjid. Yeah, at the masjid. All right. Yeah, Targeting the, the Muslim community, right? Yeah. By the way, I've heard. Maybe you can verify this for me. That I've heard that some people trade drugs at Juma time. Not this, at, not not this masjid. masjid. Not this masjid, but some other masjid. Nah. <laughs> Yeah. Somebody uh, offered you drugs here? Yeah? <laughs> okay. Alhamdulillah, that's still uh, some iman. <laughs> somebody came in this message and told me, you know what happened on the boardwalk yesterday? Uh, yesterday? Mm. I said, yeah, I saw some store closed early. He said, that's it. That's mm. what I was going to tell you. Trying to persuade your friend to drink or smoke. Okay, what else? How about how about uh, bringing uh, getting? How about you know? Sometimes some there are many Muslims who are real estate agents. Okay, and they're not working with Islamic finance. They're working with regular banks, and they encourage people. Hey, you want to buy a house? What's wrong? Why don't you buy a house? And obviously, they're not telling them that, hey, I'm going to take you to a Sharia-compliant bank to get some money. They're like, hey, I'm going to take you to PNC Bank to get some loan, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a very serious sin. It's promoting sin amongst the Muslims. Yeah. Uh, does it say purposely splitting people apart? Purposely splitting people apart. Okay, but promoting sins, think about those people who own and work in TV channels, especially in the Muslim world. What do you think about them? Right? Promoting sins amongst Muslims, right? Making ads for haram products, right? Making ads for haram products. That's why, you know, um, with regards to this, this is a very difficult thing that those are the things that make money. So the halal TV channels, which only have halal programming, is very difficult for them to survive. Because what makes the money is the haram. That's why the halal TV channels, they always need donations to continue running. Okay, and it's a good cause, by the way, 
that the opposite of promoting sins amongst the Muslims is to promote good amongst the Muslims. Okay? And in our time, providing a halal TV station is a good thing for them. It's a good thing for them because we're all used to watching TV. Okay? So if we could make the TV halal, then it was, it's much good that you're doing. Okay? So a person committing any of these sins of others have been indicated in the book and the sunnah that these are major sins and they need to make tawbah before they die. So now this brings us to the next thing. And we're just going to introduce the topic very lightly, which is the topic of washing the body. Washing the body. So far, what we have talked about, who knows what we have talked about. We have covered 95 pages of this book, by the way. So uh, whoever has been attending, keep it up. So we talked about the, the arrival of death what a person who is dying should do and what, what a person who is around a person who is dying should do. Uh, we talked about grieving and mourning over the dead. Okay, What is the proper method? What is the pro proper things about that? What are innovations associated with that? And we talked about signs of good and the signs of evil ends. So today we are starting chapter number 5. And uh, this is washing of the body. And as you know that one of the... What is the ruling on washing the body? Washing the dead body is fard kifaya, well, is fard kifaya, which means that it is a communal obligation. This job has to be done. This job has to be done, and if some people do it, then everyone is free of sin. But if no one does it, then everyone is a sinful. If there's a Muslim, if there's a Muslim in our town, in our community, who died and no one washed him, then each and every single one of us is a sinner. Okay, but if a few people wash them, then everyone is free of sin. And the same goes for janazah, praying janazah over them, and to bury them, these are all communal obligations. As long as someone does it, then everyone is free from sin. If no one does it, then everyone is a sinner. And on this topic, let me ask you, what are some other communal obligations? What are some other communal obligations? Who can tell us? What else is Fard Kifaya? Taking care of masjid. Taking care of masjid. Okay. What is that? Ertikaf. Ertikaf. Actually, according to the, some scholars, it's Fard Kifaya. But according to other scholars, it is uh, highly recommended, but not Fard Kifaya. Salatu Janazah. Salatu we talk. What else? <coughs> Studying Islam. Studying Islam is a fard kifaya. Okay, meaning what? That every community, every community should have some people who go to study Islamic sciences, who basically go into Medina University or some type of program where they study Islam. Why? Because if no one does it, then the whole community will not have a way to get this knowledge. Okay? So in cases where someone, no one is doing it, then the community needs to get together and they need to sponsor some students who may be smart students, who may be intelligent young people, and sponsor them to go and study. Okay? Same way, same thing goes for other sciences, by the way. Right? Living in America, we know the importance of media. The importance of media. So the scholars, they have said that anything which becomes essential for Muslims, it becomes for the kifaya. Okay? Some people need to study the media. Some people need to study the media. Same time, same thing. Some people need to study mental illness. Become psychologists, psych psychiatrists. Because this is a need in our communities and we need to have this. Some people need to become domestic um, violence uh, therapists and counselors. Right? Some people need to become marriage counselors. This is an obligation. It's a communal obligation, right? If there is no resource help available, then everyone is sinful, okay? Also, the scholars say that if there's a town in which there's no doctor, if there's a town, be, having a doctor is something essential, right? So if there's a town in which there's no doctor, then it is for the entire town to sponsor someone to go and study to become a doctor and come back and be a doctor for that town. Okay, if there's a town in which there is no one to dig graves, 
then the town needs to provide the service. Okay, they need to come together to pay for this. So the, the common things which are common good are communal obligations, right? And people need to do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا كَانَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لِيَنْفِرُوا كَافَ فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِّنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٌ لِيَتَفَقَّهُوا فِي الدِّينِ Right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when the Muslims, even when the Muslims go out for battle, then why is it that some group of people don't stay behind to study the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to understand the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لِيُنذِرُوا قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ So that they will warn the people when they come back, meaning that when they come back they will teach them this is how you make your salah, this is how you make your zakah, this is how you give your, uh, this is how you make your hajj. Right? So it's a communal obligation. Yes? What does Fard Kifaya actually mean? Fard Kifaya is, uh, it means communal obligation. Okay, Fard is obligatory, and Kifaya means that if someone does it, it is sufficient for all. Okay? So, what is that? That's exactly what it is. Yeah. If one group does it, they do yeah. it for themselves and for the rest of the They do it for the others as well. So the Prophet ﷺ, he commanded the Muslims to perform the washing in various ahadith. And also he performed, uh, we'll discuss some of the ahadith that he discussed. He commanded the washing of his daughter. When his daughter, um, عنها, she died, uh, which one was the last daughter that died? It was Zainab عنها, in his life. So he ordered for her to be washed, and we'll discuss that hadith. And also a man who died in Ihram, the Prophet said, wash him and shroud him, but do not cover his face and hands, and do not perfume him. Um, the washing process, who, tells, who can tell us when was the first washing done? When, how far back does this sunnah of washing the dead body go to? Obviously, it began before the death of the Prophet ﷺ, right? It happened to other people. So, who else? Who can tell us? How far back in history does it go? When was the first washing done? Since Adam ﷺ. Yes, the first washing of was, the, was of the first human being, which was Adam ﷺ. And who washed him? Al Malaika, the angels came down when Adam salam died. The Prophet salam, said, When Adam died, the angels washed him with water an odd number of times and they dug his lahat. Lahat will talk about this. Uh, they dug his, um, they dug his lahat and said, This will be a guidance for Adam to his descendants, meaning that his children will follow the same routine that they will wash their dead and they basically did this to show the people what needs to be done. What is that? That was the sunnah. That was the sunnah, yes. Hadi sunnah to Adam fi wuldihi. Therefore a number of Muslims must hasten to wash the body of a dead Muslim and prepare it for burial. Now with regards to the reports from the Sunnah of the Prophet, ﷺ, we have the report that Washing the body uh, are those of washing the Prophet's daughter Zainab and washing the Prophet ﷺ himself. The Prophet ﷺ himself was washed and by the companions, we'll talk about that right now. With regards to his daughter, Ummu Atiyah reported that the Prophet ﷺ came in while they, she and other women were washing his daughter Zainab Obviously, when he came in, he did not look at the awra. He came in because he came in with his face the other way so that he could talk to them and tell them how to do it. So, the Prophet ﷺ said to them, wash her three times or five times or seven times or more times if you find it necessary, basically an odd number of times, using water and ground leaves of lotus. Okay, we'll talk about what lotus is. And the Prophet ﷺ also said, start with her right side and the places of wudu of her body. Okay, so we'll talk about the procedure of washing the next week. Uh, actually, does anyone want to play dead for us next week? 
I'm thinking either we could get a volunteer no. or we could get a mannequin. We could get a mannequin and uh, wash the mannequin. <laughs> or we could wash a real guy. <laughs> huh? Do you have to get wet? No, you don't have to get wet. But you have to lay down and it's uncomfortable for a long time. Long time. Who has a mannequin? Who has access to a mannequin? Who can get us a mannequin next week? You can get one? A male mannequin? Huh? A male mannequin. Okay, alright. Because, you know, it's different. Okay, so they asked her, they asked the Prophet, should we wash her an odd number of times? So he replied, yes, and include on the last time some camphor. When you finish, inform me. So they washed her as he instructed, and they untied her hair. They untied her hair, washed it, and divided it into three braids, the two sides and the center, and arranged it behind her head. When they finished, they informed the Prophet wasallam. He gave them his iza. His iza. What is iza? His lungi. Right? He gave them his iza, and he said, wrap her with it. Wrap her with it. So this hadith is very important because it provides us some very important details about how washing is done, and we'll cover that next week in more practical way. Uh, there's no text in the sunnah which tells us exactly how much water and lotus and camphor needs to be mixed, but basically lotus was their soap. Okay, so they had leaves of lotus and they would ground it and they would mix it in water and it would serve as a soap. Okay, it would serve as a soap. So in our time, you don't have to use lotus, you can just use soap. Okay, you, uh, so they use soap when they wash the dead body. How was the washing of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, done? How was the washing of Allah's Messenger? It is important to have a person of knowledge of the sunnah direct the washing process in order to guide the others and correctly interpret what is observed. Okay, now this is an important thing that when people wash, when people wash, once again this is a thing where many people do a lot of bid'at, a lot of innovations. We'll talk about some common innovations, right? Many people do a lot of innovations, so that's why it is important that someone who understands and knows the sunnah supervise the process. Okay? Someone should supervise the process and that's why it's important for women to understand and learn this well so that they could be there and even if they aren't watching, they could be present and they could guide them if they're doing something wrong. Okay? And that's what the Prophet himself did, is that he came in, they were watching him, he came in, he said, do it this way. Okay? Same way with regards to brothers, we need to understand this, we need to learn this and inshallah what I will do actually is that uh, I will make, after we are done with this series, I'm going to make a cheat sheet on the fiqh of janazah. A cheat sheet on the fiqh of janazah is basically one sheet of paper which has all the important information on how to wash, how to shroud, how to bury, right? It would be one sheet so that every, I will post some here uh, and then you, I also have make it available as a copy that you can take so in any time you need it, you can quickly make a quick reference to that and then you can understand. That cheat sheet is not use, useful if you have not attended the class. Okay? But if you have attended the class, then you know when you read one point, you know all the stuff that we discussed behind it. Okay? Then it's good for, good for you. So with regards to the Prophet ﷺ, a Shabi reported that the Prophet ﷺ was watched by Ali. Ali who? Ali ibn Abi Talib, Al-Fadl ibn Abbas, and Osama bin Zayd radiallahu anhu. Three companions, and how are they related to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Who can tell us? Who is Ali to the Prophet? His cousin. His cousin. He's also the son-in-law of the Prophet, right? Who is Fadl, Fadl, ibn, uh, Fadl ibn Abbas to the Prophet? He's also his cousin. Who is Osama bin Zayd to the Prophet? Uh, Osama bin Zayd was a young general, yes. But also he was very close to the Prophet 
he grew up in the house of the Prophet. Okay, because his father Zayd was at one time the adopted son of the Prophet. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made adoption haram in Islam. So then they still lived together, but did not, he was not called the adopted son anymore. Okay, but they still lived and the Prophet loved Usama bin Zayd. Okay, so these three were very close to the Prophet and they watched the Prophet So what this shows is that those who are close family members, they have the first right of washing the person. Okay. Uh, however, if they don't know how to wash, then outside people from the community who are knowledgeable should be brought in, and that's more better. That's more better. But what you can do is that if one person knows, he could be there and let the relatives do the washing, but he guides them or she guides them. This is how you do it. This is how you don't do. So Ali radiAllahu anhu reported. He said, "When I washed Allah's messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam." I expected to observe on him what is normally observed in dead people, but saw none of that. But saw none of that. He, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was in good, was good in look and smell, alive and dead. So. Um, Basically, what he's saying is that when, when someone dies, when a person dies, what happens to his body? Hold up. Huh? Hold up. If body becomes cold, what else? It starts, to, it starts to get hard, right? Very hard. In fact, by the way, you know how the, sometimes someone dies? They cannot bend anything. They can't bend. Actually, well, sometimes someone dies, right? And uh, the doctors, they look at this person and they say, this person died four hours ago. Or this person died 11 hours ago. The way they measure that is that the body starts to freeze in a certain way. Okay? And if, are, if the body is not handled, the body actually spreads like this. Okay? And they have actually done experiments on people and measured that in two hours the body is here, in four hours it's here, in six hours it's here, in eight hours it's here. So when actually when someone dies like you know out in the woods or something like that, they look at the body and by the shape of the body they determine how long ago this person died. Okay? But it doesn't have, like, the expansion does not begin right away, right? And that's why they actually, they kind of sometimes tie a rope around the person because it's starting to happen already. Okay? So they tie a rope around to hold it together. The body gets inflated sometimes. Sometimes it gets inflated depending on what they died from. Especially if they died from drowning, then the body becomes a balloon. Okay? So, so Ali radiallahu anh said, I expected to see in the Prophet the thing that I would see in any other person, but the Prophet, and also there's a smell. There's a smell of death. Okay? But Ali said, I did not see any of that. I did not, meaning that. You know, because the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden the earth to harm the bodies of the Prophets. Okay? So basically the body of the Prophet ﷺ, although he's dead, he will not have the same thing that happens to any other person. Because he's a Prophet of Allah. Okay? But this does not mean that he's alive. Okay? Aisha radiallahu anha reported that when the Sahaba wanted to watch the Prophet wasallam, they said, by Allah, we do not know whether to undress Allah's Messenger wasallam, like we do for our deceased or wash him in his clothes. Okay? Basically, when a person dies and you wash them, the first thing you do when you wash them is you actually take off everything. And normally what people do is they actually, they don't take them off, they just cut it off. They just cut from the sides and pull it off, right? Because they're not going to use these clothes again for the most part. So they just cut it out, right? Um, so uh, so that when the Prophet ﷺ died, now the Sahaba, they're thinking, how do we wash the Messenger of Allah? <coughs> do we remove the clothes of the Prophet of Allah? So what do you think should be done? No? no? Yeah. Yes? Okay, so they differed, they differed, and a miracle happened. They all fell asleep. Suddenly, fell, they fell asleep. 
to the point that their chins hit their chest. Mm -hmm. Meaning what? They went like this. Sleep. Yeah. Deep sleep. Deep sleep. And when they were sleeping, a person whom they did not know addressed them from the corner of the house, mm -hmm. saying, Wash the Prophet in his clothes. Who was this person? Jibreel or an angel. Or an angel to, to guide them, to guide them that this is how you wash the Messenger of Allah وسلم, wash him in his clothes. Okay? So what they did is that they washed him in his long shirt on. Okay? He, uh, he, he had a, a long shirt. So they kept him on, which basically covered him down to his knees. And they kept that on, and then they washed him, and they poured water over him, and they scrubbed him within that shirt. They did not remove his clothing because it is not appropriate for the Messenger of Allah وسلم, to be undressed. Okay? Uh, to be undressed by other people, right? Also, by the way, another thing which we'll discuss later is that the Prophet also said that it is not appropriate for anyone to lead the janaza of a Prophet. Okay? Except the Prophet. And there is no Prophet now. So the Prophet's janaza was led by who? It was not led by anyone. The Prophet Janaza was not led by anyone. People came in groups of ten and they prayed individually on him. They would stand in a line of ten people because they were in the room of Aisha and only ten people could fit there standing shoulder to shoulder, foot to foot. They would come in, they would pray Janaza individually and leave. Then the next ten would come. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why the Prophet Wasallam's burial was late. Okay, they took about one and a half day. He died on a Monday and he was buried on a Wednesday. He died on a Monday and he was buried on a Wednesday, almost two days basically. The reason for this was that everywhere news reached, people came out. Okay, so there was a line, a huge line of people wanting to pray Janazah over the Prophet. So they came 10 by 10, 10 by 10. So non stop the Janazah is going on. Except that there is no Imam on the janazah of the Prophet Everyone prayed individually. Inshallah, we'll stop here and we'll continue next week. And we'll, next week, we will continue, we will cover the entire washing from beginning to end, okay? So next week is a very important session. It's a very important session. So uh, please make time for it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Any questions? Smiling. Okay. So yeah, just let me just mention this. That we said that normally a person who dies as a shaheed, uh, it is seen at times that there is a smile on their face. And we talked about it last week that the scholars, they have said that when a person, the, the Prophet had it said in the hadith that when a person who dies as a shaheed, when he's struck with a blow that's going to kill him, some things happen. And one of the things that happen is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows him Jannah. Okay, he sees Jannah at that moment. And some of the scholars they say that when he sees Jannah, a smile comes on his face. And that smile is how he dies. So it kind of becomes frozen on his face. Okay, so actually uh, there's a sheikh, you guys know Sheikh Hassan Abu Nal. Okay, uh, the sheikh he came here once too. So he showed me a picture of his sheikh, his sheikh in Quran, okay? And this sheikh, he was like 90 some, 80 some years old, 80 or 90 years old. And this sheikh had recited the Quran in its entirety every single week for 70 years in a row. For 70 years in a row. And he showed me a picture and he was not smiling. He was laughing. He was laughing. He showed me that picture. He said, he said, 70, one Quran every week for 70 years. You know, this is, this is the best thing, right? So I want to mention this to encourage us all to be companions of the Quran. He was smiling, not laughing. He, well, he was, he's dead. I'm going to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> What I mean to say that a smile is like a smile, but he was, you could yeah, like see his teeth, you could see his, I mean, like big, 
Yes. Big smile. And the smile was so big that it's not appropriate to call it a smile. It's appropriate to call it a laugh. <laughs> okay, subhanallah, so, bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa. I'm going to stop through if I want to tubu inshallah, we're praying five minutes. <laughs> Good point.